Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. It's time for another edition of the Gardening Simplified Show, coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Stacy Hervella is here with me. I'm Rick Weist and Adriana Robinson, our producer and engineer of the Gardening Simplified Show. Stacy, as spring advances, sunlight increases, and a host of natural events are set in motion. The temperatures rise, the ice melts, the soil warms, the plants grow, the flowers bloom, and the hummingbirds return. I can't wait. I can't wait either. Honestly, I had a minor freak out last year when I saw my first hummingbird in April. I was so beyond excited. We were sitting outside one April evening, a nice evening, and I saw the hummingbird go to its spot in the magnolia where, you know, because they're territor- very territorial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was like, well, what the heck? Where's that thing that has the delicious, delicious sugar water? And I freaked out and I ran down to the basement and I got the hummingbird feeder and scrubbed it all up and boiled the water and wasted no time in making sure they knew they were welcome back. That is great. I love that. (laughs) Well, you know why hummingbirds migrate north, right? Is this a pun or a joke? It's too far to walk. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Especially when you're that size. They're so tiny. Oh, they're so tiny. And hummingbirds are just so amazing, and that's why we as gardeners love them so much. I mean, if you think about it, as I understand it, they are the only bird that can fly backwards. I think I've heard that too. And I think that's true. I can't think of any other bird that can fly backwards unless there's hurricane force winds. <laughs> and then or they're not whatever. flying. They're just, uh, you know, my biggest hummingbird question. What? How can such a tiny thing pack so much rage into its little body? Isn't that something? They are <laughs> territory. They, yes, it's incredible. And, you know, I've been laughing so much over this past winter. I put out suet feeders and, you know, all the suet feeder winter birds are so cooperative. It's just like, oh, after you, Mr. Donnie Woodpecker. No, no, no. I insist, Sparrow friend. And they're Sharon and there's like three of them on the suet feeder at once. But man, those hummingbirds is like, don't you dare come near my feeder. And the thing that amazes me is they waste so much energy Mm -hmm. defending their territory. (laughs) It's like you'd have to eat half as much if you didn't just get so mad when any other hummingbird came within like two feet of you. I tell you what, they pack a punch. The smallest migrating bird, hummingbirds. Yeah, you're right. I have a theory on that, Stacey, and that is that uh, many times we find with hummingbirds, they love, I'm going to call them tubular flowers, Mm -hmm. like if you envision a a trumpet vine. And I think with tubular flowers, it may be that for other competitors, it's a little more difficult Mm -hmm. to get to the nectar, whereas the hummingbirds are uh, are well suited for tubular flowers. Honeysuckle is another one that comes to mind that maybe that's why they have that, that kind of competitive rage within them that they, they're just like, this is my spot and leave me alone. You know, uh, I put out two hummingbird feeders. I have a ton of stuff in flower at any given moment during the growing season. And it really does not seem to matter how much surplus of food there is. They're just like, so so protective and and honestly that's one of the things that makes him so much fun to watch is because well it's it, true and the other thing of course is is they have to eat a lot uh proportionately to the size of their body they're just burning up their uh so much ener- energy what what would you call that a, a metabolism? metabolizing yeah yeah metabolic or whatever metabolic metabolic thank you <laughs> stacy to the rescue again metabolic right yeah thank you uh, their rate, I read somewhere that it'd be equivalent to people eating 300 hamburgers a day to survive. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I believe it. You know, I probably, I have to change my feeders at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, depending. And I probably go through about a 10-pound bag of sugar in, in, in one season. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, timing is everything. And same thing with the hummingbirds. They can't get north too early right. they need the food sources but they got to get there early enough to set up uh, nesting locations and during nesting season as i understand it stacy you know we think about nectar and hummingbird feeders and flowers that provide nectar but they also uh, eat 
insects, and probably during that mating period, insects are very important. Yes, insects are very important. And you know what else? I don't know if you knew about this. Spider webs yes. are super crucial to hummingbirds' lives. Um, and I have actually been fortunate enough to see them foraging for spider webs around the edges of my house and my neighbor's house. So That's right, cool. right where the house meets the the foundation, you know, where it's like where spiders would like to spin mm -hmm. webs, they will just go around as if they are browsing for food, but just fly directly around wow. that that line. And they use spider webs uh, for their nests to hold their little teeny tiny nests together. And um, at the Desert Botanical Garden in Tucson, Arizona, they have a hummingbird exhibit. It's an enclosure. Okay. One of the only hummingbird exhibits in, I think, in the entire world. And uh, they, the hummingbirds were really not doing well. They weren't thriving. And they realized it was because they, there were no spiders wow. for them to actually build their nests. And so they started, you know, releasing spiders and letting the spiders grow in there. And um, it's quite an interesting place to visit if you are in the area. But, of course, here in Michigan, we only have one hummingbird that uh, is the ruby-throated. And I'm not complaining because I'm honestly... So, so grateful. You know, sometimes it just really hits me that uh, hummingbirds are native only to the Americas. And there are people all around the world for whom a hummingbird is a lifer bird. Yeah. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm just like doing my dishes and uh, there's another ruby throat. <laughs> 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 That's fantastic. I love that. No, you're right. Those nests are amazing. Tiny little nests and uh, the use of spider webs to create those nests. Very, very interesting. I was reading a flock of hummingbirds can be referred to as a bouquet, a glittering, a shimmer, or a tune. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever heard that before. I hadn't. I've never. Those are all delightfully poetic names for such an angry little bird, particularly <laughs> when they are in a group, because that's when they're their angriest, is when they're yeah. around other hummingbirds. Exactly. I know a lot of people who, for whom I think a hummingbird would be a good mascot. <laughs> they share a lot <laughs> in common. <laughs> well, you know, you know what you get when you cross a... a I'm going to give you a dad joke here. <laughs> Folks who watch on YouTube, download our podcast, listen on radio, you know I'm a baby bloomer, and so... Dad jokes are my forte. You know what you get when you cross a hummingbird with a doorbell? A humdinger. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done. So journeynorth.org was a website we talked about when a few weeks ago, Stacy, you and I talked about monarch butterflies. And I've been tracking that. And uh, again, unusual warm weather in the southeast. So I'm starting to see where some of these sightings are popping up like you had last April or in the month of April. Uh, in some of these areas like Texas, South Carolina, Mississippi, Georgia, there have already been some sightings. I believe it. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, they're starting to wake up. And, and, you know, they really, when you think about that migration, they're following blooming northward as things start to come out and bloom. And, um, you know, we tend to think of hummingbirds as as visiting plants that are higher up. But I have often seen them in spring visiting plants that are quite low growing. Like yeah. some of the things in my gardens like GM Triflorum, uh, Prairie Smoke, they'll visit that. And that's just a few inches above the ground. Yeah, I love the uh, Proven Winners Salvia Rockin' series, the Ooh, blue suede those. shoes, the fuchsia, the deep purple. Uh, the play in the blues. The important aspect here, Stacy, real quickly is, and we'll post the list of these favorite plants for uh, – uh, for hummingbirds. I mean, you have to have bee balm on the yeah. list and crocosmia and many of these, these different plants. But uh, the key here is color and bright color. Uh, we had our bee show a few weeks ago. We understood that they have a sense of smell, but with hummingbirds, it's not smell. It's flying by quickly. And uh, whoa, what was that bright color, right? Yeah, I've even seen them investigate. I, uh, I once hung a uh, like a bird feeder thing in my tree with a piece of red yarn, and they investigated the piece of red yarn. Wow. <laughs> Sorry that, to disappoint, guys. <laughs> that is great. Well, you know, of course, you can hang out some hanging baskets, too. I mm -hmm. love to put out fuchsias or caliber coas. Those yeah. two in hanging baskets also are great for attracting them. Yeah, and beautiful plants, too. We'll put the list of plants at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Coming up next along the hummingbird theme. Don't miss this. Plants on Trial, Stacy will introduce us to one next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. 
Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show. You know, um, Adriana does such a great job making the YouTube version of our show, and our YouTube audience has been growing. And uh, this past week, we got a comment from a YouTube viewer who was like, hey, y'all keep talking about these plants for cold climates. I'm down here in zone 10. What do you got for me? And I would just like to apologize. I would never intend to exclude anybody. Um, and, you know, I could go on and on about this. And we are going to get to, today, to today's shrub on trial, plants on trial. But, um, you know, the USDA hardiness zone system. So when we talk about, how, you know, where a plant will grow, it doesn't deal with heat tolerance. Right. It only deals with cold tolerance. And so people who live in really hot climates, it can be very difficult to determine if some of our plants will actually do well for you because, you know, a Southern California zone 10 is much different than like a uh, zone 10 in a tropical area. So there's all these other factors. But I did want to uh, make sure that I gave you a plant today that you could certainly grow. And since our theme today is hummingbirds, there was one logical choice. And that is Estrellita Little Star Bouvardia. Bouvardia. Do you know Bouvardia? Bouvard. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And as a matter of fact, know the history of the plant, too. It was named Ooh. after Charles Bouvard. He was the physician to Louis the Thirteenth, King of France. Ooh. That's so, a, at least that's a, how I understand. A royal lineage yeah. here. Um, this also known as firecracker bush, but most typically I think people do tend to call it Bouvardia. Um, and this is a plant that is absolutely 100% heat tolerant to USDA zone 10 and possibly 11. Probably the only reason we don't have it up to USDA zone 11 is because uh, there is no USDA zone 11 in the continental US. It's all... U.S. territories okay. and, and really, really tropical climates. Um, but this is a plant that is native to North America. It grows in southern Arizona, Texas, uh, northern Mexico, and um, very frost tender. So uh, very often, as we've discussed, the hardier a plant is, the less heat tolerant it is. And the more heat tolerant a plant is, the less hardy it is. And uh, Estrellita little star buvardia is no exception. It is hardy only down to USDA zone 8 and heat tolerant through 10 or 11, like I said. But now I don't want our cold climate friends to tune out here because Estrellita little star is an awesome plant to grow in a patio container to attract hummingbirds. I have done it myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I got hummingbirds all summer long because this is a shrub that not only doesn't stop flowering, but has flowers that are the perfect shape for a hummingbird. And that's what we were talking about in the first segment exactly, Stacy. Tubular flowers in abundance, long lasting, and very, very bright colored. Oh, the color, you know, I could go on about the color. It's so hard to describe. Um, it's red. But it's also kind of pink and exactly. kind of orange. Um, it is just, it's really unlike anything else. I know the first time that I saw this plant when um, our R&D manager brought it in, I was just like, what is that? I have never seen anything like this color before. So they start out this kind of, it's not even like a regular like lipsticky red like most people would think of. Um, but they start out this beautiful scarlet red. And then as they age, they take on a kind of a pinky orange tone so that you're getting multiple multiple colors of flowers all at once on this little shrub. You're right. You get that hint of orange in there. And for me out in the garden, I love the pink orange combination mm. anyhow. Yeah. I mean, it, it just jumps out at you. Well, you know, I am a bold color person in the garden. Props to all the people that do their pretty watercolor pastels, but I like <laughs> really bold, obnoxious colors. And so this is the perfect plant for me. And again, if you're curious about it, you can visit Gardening Simplified on air.com and see pictures of it and all of the information. And, you know, if you're the kind of gardener who, you know, likes to have your patio plants benefit butterflies and hummingbirds, and you've been looking for something that's a little bit out of the ordinary, I would definitely recommend that you try it. So I'm saying Estrellita, which is the Spanish word for little star. So the name of this plant is basically little star, little star. Um, and uh, it's probably, in most areas, going to be one of the only Bouvardias that you actually find at the garden center. If you're familiar with the name Bouvardia, it's most likely because it is very popular as a cut flower. Yes, it's said to represent enthusiasm Ooh. 
and a zest for life. So yes, that you will sense. many times find it in those arrangements. Well, it's really popular for weddings because mm-hmm. there are some really lovely white ones. And, you know, the connection here also is that this does not stop flowering. Um, it will really never be without flowers. And that's a really good thing for a cut flower grower or florist is that you're going to have that consistent supply for stems. But it's also amazing news for people who want to grow it in their landscape or garden because it really will flower all summer. And when I grew mine, it started from just a little quart plant. So like a four and a half inch pot that um, I got here. And it really quickly grew to fill out like a nice 14 inch container and truly did not stop flowering all summer long. Now, if you were to see a Bouvardia in the wild, no doubt the color of its flowers would attract you and make you go, what's that? But the overall shape and habit of the plant kind of leaves much to be desired. I don't know if you looked at pictures of it. Um, And of course, out in the wild, a plant knows, owes nobody good looks. It's just there for its survival. Um, But if you look at pictures of it, you know, they're pretty rangy. They're open, they're sparse. And I think that's part of the reason there's a number of people who are not familiar with uh, Bouvardia. Because, you know, we we love our hibiscus and our mandevillas, bougainvillea, whatever, that in the north we plant outside during the, the summer. And Bouvardia was a plant that was used extensively in the landscape again in these warm regions but introduced in the U.S. as a house plant Mm. and without the proper light indoors you're not going to get that blooming and the plant uh, is not going to be nearly as desirable. You're going to be kind of sad. You're going to be disappointed. (laughs) But that's what we were trying to do uh, with the development of Estrella to Little Star was to get a more landscape friendly habit. So something that can really work in a more tamed setting um, and not be so open and so sprawling like Bouvardia is, and that's what really makes this one different. Now, if you look at our native Bouvardia, Bouvardia turnifolia, you're going to see similar color, but again, this is going as a nice, neat, tidy kind of uh, tuffet you know, roundish mm-hmm. type of plant. Maybe not quite. It's not quite as tight as a tuffet, but, um, and I think, you know, has great potential in the landscape. If you live in a warm climate, you can grow it outdoors all year round, although you will need to protect it uh, if a frost or freeze threatens. And again, like I said, if you live in a cold climate, it's a great choice for a little bit of summer color and something really different. I combine it with uh, kufia, the vermilion oh. or kufia in my garden. Wow. And you must draw the hummingbirds. I do. Wow. That, that's how I pick my annuals. Is, is wow. Do they attract hummingbirds? See, for me, and I, of course, uh, a long time ago, Stacy, you dubbed me the Canna King. Yes. And I love cannas. And I'll tell you what, if you want hummingbirds in your yard, red cannas. All right. Just I've... a little canna commercial here, and <laughs> you may continue. By the way, I'm just, we're going to slow down here a second. Gardening Simplified on air.com. And of course, you'll be able to get more information on this amazing plant uh, on our website. And for uh, Stacy, for people who are listening to us on radio or the podcast and they're driving, because I know it just rolls off your tongue. What is the name of this plant? Estrellita Little Star Bouvardia. <laughs> All you really need to remember is Little Star Bouvardia, if you're not familiar with Spanish, um, and you will find it, or just go to provenwinnerscolorchoice.com, and you can look for it there, or of course, at Gardening Simplified on air. So Rick, I'm going to have to ask you for a chunk of your red canna, because I have not grown cannas in my hummingbird oh, my annuals word. before. I mean, so. They just, uh, they flock to them, and I've got baskets of them so i'll give you a whole basket full oh, all right i don't know if i need a whole basket but just a uh, <laughs> just a couple okay. uh pieces all right. so uh if you want to grow this whether you're talking about growing it as a patio plant or a garden plant if you live in a warm climate um it is a full sun plant but it can take part sun so about half a day's of sun um and outdoors in warm climates it will basically bloom all year round uh which is a very very cool thing now Generally, things that bloom that much do appreciate a little bit of extra fertilizer. It takes a lot of energy to put all of those flowers. So I would recommend somewhat regular fertilizing, especially if you're growing it in a container. I know I fertilize mine when I fertilize the rest of my annuals, which is like every two weeks or something like that. And uh, I will also, I'm happy to report that the deer never once touched my Bouvardia, knock on wood. Uh, So I feel pretty confident in saying that this is also a deer resistant plant. So, so many reasons to grow this really unique, beautiful flowering shrub from Proven Winners Flowering, Proven Winners Color Choice Flowering Shrubs. Uh, For all the information, 
Just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and you can get everything you need to know to grow this and your own landscape. And look for the plant. The name of the plant is... Estrellita Little Star Bouvardia. It's time for us to take a little break, but when we come back, we're going to be answering your gardening questions. So please stay tuned to the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Now, we don't just say we simplify gardening. We actually do it by answering your questions. One of our absolute favorite things to do, and I know as the season gets underway here, we're probably going to have a lot of people wondering what the heck to do. Uh, and you can reach <laughs> us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and click contact us. And that is an easy way to send us your gardening questions. So what do we got on tap today, Rick? Well, right off the bat, Teresa sends us a question from West Michigan. With the recent thaw, I saw my hellebores are budding. Now, uh, are they blasted by snow and ice, and are they going to die, and should I cover them, and are they done for? And Well, this one for me, Stacy, is really easy because to Teresa, I would say, no, they're not done for. They're perfectly fine. I, it, it's not unusual to see them budding under the snow. Nope, it isn't at all. And I think, you know, a lot of what people are here in West Michigan, just as an example, a lot of people are feeling really anxious about what they're seeing growing. But the simple fact is that, you know, short of having an extremely heavy snow cover at this time that the sunlight can't even penetrate, yeah. a lot of these things that we are now seeing would have been emerging under the snow anyway. It's just that the snow melts and then we see them. And now we've had this kind of, snow melt snow melt and you start to to worry and we have had an unusually warm um spring but and so we're more aware right yeah but the, and you don't have to worry about your uh, uh hellebores at all they do very often start to bud and you know some plants they just have no problem with standing you know this kind of cold now you do have to worry about things like peaches apples those types of plants that Ha that require accumulated warmth in order to bloom, those are going to be very sensitive to to frost and early emergence. Yeah. But bulbs, hellebores, it's like they have some sort of built-in antifreeze. It really doesn't bother them at all. So They do, um, although I do have bad news for you, uh, Stacy, and that is I had lunch with someone today. I have always trumpeted, I love hellebores, and I've always trumpeted them as being just bulletproof when it comes to deer. And uh, this gentleman told me the deer ate his hellebores this They ate mine. Oh. I mean, not. <laughs> <laughs> you say that so matter of fact. They ain't mine. <laughs> well, I don't, put a, I don't put anything past my deer anymore. Um, oh, dear. But it's not terrible. Like, it's definitely a last resort. Like, they, you can tell they didn't enjoy it. <laughs> so. <laughs> the buck stops at Stacy's house. So, and, you know, it, the interesting thing about hellebores, of course, is that the foliage that they have out now is old foliage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, usually right. I would cut that off in a few weeks right. anyway. So if they eat that, pff, whatever. Um, now, if they eat the flowers, on the other hand, we're going to have an issue. Um, but it's not a problem if they nibble the foliage. And they don't do it too much, but uh, I would not consider them to be bulletproof. All quite. right. All right. Uh, Jin writes to us, hi, I really enjoy and I'm always looking forward to your channel on YouTube every Saturday. Thank you, Jin. We appreciate that. And for folks watching on YouTube, please share with uh, friends and neighbors. Uh, Jin says, I live in Iowa City, zone 5B, close to a wooded area where I have deer and rabbits. Oh, I thought Troutman Juniper was deer resistant with their prickle stem that kept poking me while I planted. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that deer were desperate enough to eat both of my <laughs> Troutman junipers in the middle of January. Oh, bummer. I love Troutman juniper so much, is how she <laughs> writes it. Should I replace the new ones with the condition shown in the attached, or will they generate new growth this spring? Yeah, so thanks for those photos, Jen. They broke my heart. <laughs> They're helpful to answer your question, but uh, yeah, that is heartbreaking. And junipers are generally not a favorite of deer, but right. you just can't predict. Yeah. And I did, I planted new junipers myself last year. I did spray them um pretty aggressively in fact i probably need to do that today just because they're going to be getting desperate again um so they're not they they will become more deer resistant as they mature but when things are new you know deer are much more likely uh to grow them now i did look at your pictures and we will put those in the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com and uh 
I would say that I would leave them. They have been pretty severely chowed down, but there still is growth on them. Of course, I don't know what they looked like when you planted them, so I can't for sure say um, how much, excuse me, how much they have, have been damaged. But I think that there is enough that with some TLC and fertilizer, so I would definitely plan on fertilizing at least monthly from as soon as your soil thaws up until late July. Make sure they don't get water stressed. I think they will come back. On the other hand, if you're just like, you know what? Can't deal with this. It's too heartbreaking. By all means, replace them and then put that deer repellent uh, pretty religiously at least uh, this season so they don't do it again. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think they'll recover, but the problem is it takes so long. Yeah. And it's difficult to have that patience. And that's a great horticultural term, chowed down. (laughs) <laughs> and it happens to all of us, it Jen. Does. And thanks for tuning into the show. We appreciate it. Linda's asking us, uh, I love listening to your shows, gaining knowledge every week. Would you please consider doing a show on lawns? I'm a baby boomer. Welcome to the club, Linda. Same here. A baby boomer who loves a well-manicured yard. I also love my birds, a vast ecosystem that happens throughout the yard. And so what Linda's doing, and, and you're not alone, Linda, she's looking for a happy medium for an eco-friendly yard and a nicely mowed green grass without weeds. And uh, we're talking about a lot of area here too, Stacy. Uh, Linda says has an acre uh, mm. that was just grass over the last five years. They're planting more and more proven winners, native shrubs, and adding a tree every year. Way to go, oh, Linda. Love, love it. Cut flower garden, rose garden, pollinator garden. This sounds like a great place. I know. I'm jealous. I'd love to visit. <laughs> Beautiful, Linda. Well, I'll tell you what. As far as turf is concerned, the one word of advice that I would give, and I've always given throughout the years, is that people make the mistake of watching sporting events, golfing or football or baseball, and they want that well-manicured, really tight, low-to-the-ground cut You can have a lawn and not be out there using all kinds of weed killers and that sort of thing simply by making sure you have a sharp blade on the mower and you raise that deck to the highest possible height. For a lot of people, they struggle with that because, again, they want that golf course lawn. But I'll tell you what, you can have both. If you raise that deck and allow that grass to shade the crown of the plant and in the process it also shades out uh, weeds that are trying to compete, there's no question in my mind, uh, Stacy. doing that one thing will make a big difference. You know, what I was also going to add uh, for Linda is we were talking uh, a, a few weeks ago about turf grass varieties. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, I just go to the garden center or whatever, and I buy lawn seed, uh, grass seed, and that's it. And that's not the case. There are so many wonderful eco mixes yes. out there with all of these different varieties of turf grass that have been specially selected and blended to need fewer inputs, to grow more vigorously and outcompete weeds. And so you can still have a really nice lawn. No, it's not going to be a golf course lawn, exactly. but you're going to have a really beautiful lawn that doesn't require a ton of fertilizer and pesticides and all those inputs that you're trying to get away from, um, but still have that same look that you want. So I would say as you're considering you know, whether you have to patch uh, areas of your lawn that have had damages or you're going to be redoing whole parts of your lawn, I would say look for those eco seed mixes. And, you know, I would also say consider clover. Um, we could probably do a whole show on clover, but Nitrogen you know, fixing. back yeah. in the day, mm-hmm. many, uh, you know, about oh, a century ago, clover was an integral part of lawns because it stayed green. It added all of the nitrogen that a lawn needed. And I read actually that it was the invention of 2,4-D, uh, as a lawn, a, a popular herbicide, um, that, that killed clover mm-hmm. And kind of made everyone go, well, I don't want that anymore. And I heard that the inventor of 2,4-D, the chemist who invented it, apologized that it killed Mm. clover because it was such an important part of lawn. So I would also say, Linda, you can buy clover seed to seed into your lawn. It is so beautiful and green. It's beneficial for the bees when it flowers. And by mowing it high, you will still get flowers. So I would say, you know, really consider what you are planting, not just how you're caring for what you're planting in your lawn, not just how you're caring for it as a way to make it more eco-friendly. Yeah, clover is a nitrogen-fixing plant. So all those benefits you listed, Stacy, along with the fact that it's nitrogen-fixing, 
uh, would be beneficial for Linda's situation. And a tall turf type fescue or something like that, uh, you're right, there are many different varieties of grasses. And then raise that deck on the mower, and I think we can have some success here. Yeah, and you know what? If you have clovers in your lawn, you can spend summer days looking for four-leaf clovers, which is one of my favorite things to do. So I like that. It ain't <laughs> over until it's clover. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to have branching news. So please do stay tuned to the Gardening Simplified Show. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news, not breaking news, but branching news. And right off the top today, because hummingbirds are a topic that we could talk about for hours, I wanted to mention uh, the key invention of the hummingbird feeder where we put sugar water in a feeder. It was Lawrence Webster who uh, made that first feeder. His wife had asked him to make something that would help attract uh, hummingbirds to uh, their yard. His name's Lawrence J. Webster of Boston. He did it for his wife. Uh, She had read a 1928 National Geographic story about feeding hummingbirds from small glass bottles. And so he employed a MIT lab glass blower. And by 1947, the National Geographic ran an article about uh, these new feeders. By 1950, you have the Audubon Novelty Company uh, picking up on this, and hummingbird feeders were born. So, you know, they haven't always been around, but since 1950, this has been a thing. That is fascinating. I know I wouldn't be without one myself. Yeah. I absolutely love it. And it took me a while to come around to it, but I would highly encourage, it makes a great gift, first of all. Um, I would highly encourage anybody to to do that. Although, you know, there are some caveats that people need to know about feeding hummingbirds. Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, uh, if you're going to make your own recipe, a great place to find hummingbird food recipes is the, the Cornell site yep. or the Smithsonian. Uh, but Stacy, I think a lot of people, uh, feel that, well, I got to put food coloring in here. We got to make it red. And, and that's not the case. Heck no. Yeah. Uh, so, Definitive. So, uh, yes. I, well, there, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, things out there that you'll find on social media and so forth about how it's causing growths on hummingbirds tongues. And, um, the simple fact is that the red on the feeder is more than enough to attract the hummingbirds to the feeder. You do not need and should not color the liquid, no matter what you see at the store, um, because they do sell red tinted liquid at the store, like in the hummingbird feeder section. And there's absolutely no reason to buy that. And in fact, you know, if you want to save money and feed hummingbirds, like I said, you can just get a 10 pound bag of sugar. It costs like $5. That's more than enough all season long. All you have to do is boil some water, dissolve the sugar in it, let it cool. You can even uh, pre-make it and keep it in your fridge until you need it. And that's what I usually do. So I think, you know, just because they sell that product in the store doesn't mean you need to buy it. And it doesn't mean it's what you need to emulate. Um, So I would encourage anybody who wants to do right by hummingbirds to do just a teensy bit of research. And in fact, we'll do that for you and put it on the show notes at Gardening Simplified on air. Yeah, that'd be great. And of course, the camp that I fall in again is I use plants first to attract Mm -hmm. hummingbirds like the red cannas. Uh, uh, But in addition to that, Stacey, to prevent harmful mold growth, I mean, we have to frequently be cleaning these feeders. Yeah, and it does grow. So like I said, the warmer the weather, the more likely it is to grow nasties. Um, But vinegar does a very effective job of cleaning it without, you know, risking any uh, harm to to the hummingbirds. Also in branching news, uh, I found this fascinating. We're going to put the link on the website, but the DMZ, the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea is no place for people, uh, which is exactly why 70 years after the, uh, the Korean War, all kinds of rare flora and fauna have flourished on this untouched strip of the DMZ. So it's home to plants and animals that are completely unique to uh, Korea. It's quite a fascinating thing to see how this this DMZ between South and North Korea has blossomed into this area of unique and unusual plants. Hmm, I hadn't heard about that. That is fascinating. Yeah, so we're going to put that link on... um, uh, on our branching news and our website, gardening simplified on air.com. So Stacy, how do you feel about Brussels sprouts? Love them. Adore them. 
Brussels sprouts are the in thing now. They weren't always the in thing for a lot of people. I like Brussels sprouts roasted, drizzled with maple syrup. Okay, well, I I don't mind them roasted. I tend not to play up the sweetness. I like them steamed in the microwave with some butter. I like them roasted. I'm just going to say for the record, I liked Brussels sprouts before it was cool. Thanks, Mom. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's a theory on that, and the theory is this from Dutch scientists. And again, we're going to put this link at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. But Dutch scientists are experimenting with the vegetable, and they discovered why Brussels sprouts taste so bitter to some people, the compounds within Brussels sprouts. So the theory is, Stacy, that over the years they have now developed Brussels sprouts that are less bitter and guarantee high yields. And so a new age of Brussels sprouts has been born. And that's part of the reason for the popularity in, uh, in restaurants and with folks to eat Brussels sprouts. This is the dawning of the age of, of the Brussels, Brussels sprouts. sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> Sprout it from the rooftops, folks. <laughs> a trendy vegetable. You know, they call kids from Belgium, they call them Brussels sprouts, right? <laughs> yeah. I suppose they do. Maybe we should move on. I'll also put a link on the website from Cambridgeshire, UK. Now, that's just north of London. Uh, The Financial Times had a great article about snowdrops. Many of us love snowdrops, galanthus, uh, and they call these people galanthophiles, these people snowdrop lovers who uh, collect and then set up all kinds of security in their yard to keep people from stealing uh, their galanthus. So uh, there in England, uh, they have some of these folks. This gentleman's name was Joe Sharman. Uh, and, w- for example, when he goes away, he has to have security and that sort of thing because some of these galanthus or snowdrop bulbs are worth like $1,800 a piece. Oh, yeah, they have auctions and they sell for thousands of dollars. It's, it's wild. I mean, I don't know. I, I think a regular snowdrop is pretty good. <laughs> I don't need a fancy one myself. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> He's in England, so he could use what King Arthur used, surveillance. (laughs) Sir, S-I-R. I I had to spell it out so it's not a good pun. We'll move (laughs) along. (laughs) Let's see. What else do I have here for you? Uh, Orland, Maine. A couple uh, came home, and uh, they sat down in their comfortable chairs, their living room chairs, and there was squealing and a whole ruckus going on. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but uh, they got out of the chairs. There was a short-tailed weasel in the chairs. This was in Orland, Maine. Was it their pet? No. (laughs) Just got into the house somehow. And these pictures are just crazy. You know, typically you only encounter weasels in the wild. And and the problem with the weasel, too, is that they can be really nasty. Uh, So they called on a friend to help. They chased it into the bathroom, cornered it in the bathtub, then brought it to the car to release it into the woods. And, of course, weasels, uh, they've got a real musty smell. They, they just don't smell good. And so this was pretty, uh, pretty fascinating. Pop goes the weasel, and uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's never a good feeling when there's a wild animal in your house. No. No matter what. Honestly, even if it's a house fly, you're like, must evacuate right now <laughs> you know it's uh, you you feel very uh helpless and you know it's we feel like our, our homes are our shelters and they're safe and when something comes in there it's uh it, it gets your defenses up it's weaselly understandable why you wouldn't want something like that in your house okay and then in uh, california now if you build a skateboard ramp in your yard or landscape over six feet tall you might want to check with the city first the city of vista in california unanimously passed a new ordinance to fine skaters thirty four hundred dollars if they have a backyard ramp over six feet tall what six feet when I was a kid, we'd set a board out on a milk crate, and that's about six feet tall <laughs> ramp, and they have to regulate that? Oh, my word. That's unbelievable. I found the hardest thing about skateboarding is concrete. That's the hardest <laughs> thing about skateboarding. And as a baby boomer and at my age, I'm not doing it anymore. But anyhow, so if you're going to build a skateboard uh, ramp in your yard over six feet, you might want to check with the city first. Or, you know, just plant a tree instead. <laughs> 
<laughs> you got it. I love it. As a matter of fact, I couldn't have said it better myself. So enjoy your week, folks. Thank you to Adriana Robinson, our engineer and producer. Thank you, Stacy. It's been fun. Thank you, Rick. It's always a pleasure. And we hope you all have a great week.